So, uh, some things I noticed about the ministry of Jesus. Um, there were times when he was teaching where something would occur, and he would, whatever that thing would occur was, he, he would direct his thoughts and his attention to speak a word into that. And uh, many of you know we're going through the book of Ephesians right now, but in light of what's happened this last week with this uh, terrorist attack in Boston and what happened in Texas, uh, I just thought it's appropriate that we begin to search the word for what God might be speaking into that situation. And there's a passage in Luke chapter 13 that I'm just convinced, you know, speaks into what we've just experienced this last week and is so important for us to hear. And so I'd like to ask that you turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 13. We're going to read verses 1 through 9 together. If you didn't bring your own Bible, there's uh, Bibles around you and the chairs uh, surrounding you. I invite you to pick, it, pick a Bible up. You can find the passage on page 738 if you're using one of our church Bibles. Like I said, I'm going to read verses 1 through 9. So I'll start in verse 1, and as we have our Bibles open, just remind everyone that this is God's Word. So uh, beginning in verse 1. So now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Let's pause there just for a second. Uh, we don't know too much more about this event other than what's written here in verse 1. And so let's take a moment to just understand what we can understand from this verse. Apparently, there were some number of people from Galilee, Galileans. Jesus was from Galilee. Uh, it was in the northern part of Israel. Uh, apparently, these people from Galilee had gone down to Jerusalem, which is in the southern part of Israel. They'd gone to the temple there to uh, make sacrifices. This was part of their uh, celebration of God and their worship of him. So they had gone down to make sacrifices. Now, at that time, Israel had been occupied by Rome. And uh, Rome ruled Israel with a, a tight iron fist. Uh, there are many instances like this that you can read about in history. And the governor in Jerusalem at the time was a man named Pontius Pilate. And apparently what had happened when these people from Galilee had come down to Jerusalem, they were there worshiping God in the temple and uh, making their sacrifices. For whatever reason, we don't know, maybe to make some kind of political statement, Pilate came in with his soldiers and slaughtered people as they were worshiping God such that their blood was poured out and mixed with the blood of the sacrifices they were making. Okay, so that's the situation. And uh, people come up to Jesus. Now, at that time, I mean, this would have been a huge national concern. If you were an Israelite, I mean, this is egregious. It's outrageous. It's kind of wanton, terroristic death. Um, if you were an Israelite at the time, I mean, people would have been talking about this, and apparently there are some present with Jesus who said, oh, Jesus, you know, what do you think? Now, I don't know what your reaction is, but I can tell you what my reaction is. I mean, we just had this this last week. I mean, just kind of like wanton, sick, evil killing that happened in Boston. And I'm sure, you know, people come, what do you think? And I can tell you what my first reaction is. You know, my first reaction is I hope the swift justice of the American government swoops down with a hard boot in the rear end, right? <laughs> I mean, that's our, I mean, like... Whoever did this deserves the worst. You know, like, ugh, you know, we have that immediate emotional reaction. It's interesting to me that Jesus has a slightly different reaction than what our normal first reaction would have been. Verse 2, Jesus answered, Do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? He says, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Instead of just responding to this one instance or act of evil, Jesus you know, moves from the particular to the universal, and he says, hey, listen, do you think you know, we or anyone else is, is any better? Isn't it the case that all people are sinners? And if you don't repent, here's the situation, you're going to perish too. And then it's interesting what he does next, if you look at verse 4, where he says, Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Okay, let's pause there for a second. Again, we don't know too much more about this event other than what's written here. We know that there was a pool in Jerusalem called Siloam. It was right near the city walls. Apparently there was a tower that had been built up there. Uh, a tower is... Uh, 
put in a city wall for defense. Uh, this would have been a large structure, and we don't know what happened, but apparently, whether through poor engineering or some tragic accident, apparently, while a number of people were there by this wall, you know, in the place that it was least expected, and that's what ties these two events together, right? When you go to worship, you don't expect some tragic thing to happen. Right? I mean, I can, I can only liken it to this. Suppose we're here worshiping and we're celebrating communion and someone walks through the back door with a machine gun and begins to gun us down and our blood is spilt out. Wouldn't the United States just in uproar over that? Right? That's how it would have been. Like, here's a situation. I mean, in, in the most tranquil, peaceful place where you do not expect it, by a, a defensive tower... By some lack of engineering or some tragic accident, the tower falls. We don't know how many people were there, but, but there were 18 who died. Okay, and, and Jesus says, or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? He says, I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Here's what's interesting to me. I mean, just thinking about the parallels to today. So Jesus he, he, he's speaking about these two events. On the one hand, there's this terroristic, evil, wanton crime that was committed by some individual, right? I mean, not unlike what we're dealing with in Boston right now. And on the other hand, there's this tragic accident that happens as this tower fells, not unlike what we saw this week in Texas, right, at this fertilizer plant. And, and Jesus, instead of just dwelling on these two instances, he, he moves from the particular to the universal. He says, okay, hold on. You know you're all sinners, right? And unless you change your ways, unless you repent, the same thing is going to happen to you. You'll perish as well. And now, this is brilliant what Jesus does. Uh, if you are familiar with his teachings at all, you know he often taught with simple stories called parables. And uh, these parables, they're so simple on the one hand, but they're so profound on the other. And as soon as he, be, he finishes saying this, a, a about his you know, universalizing, wait, you're all sinners and we should all repent or the same's going to happen to you. He has this very short parable that is just so deep. And I want to take some time to just walk through this. So if you look with me beginning in verse 6, it says this, Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree, planted it in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Don't know how many vineyard owners we have here, so it makes take just a moment for us to kind of wrap our minds around what's going on here. So a couple of comments so that we can really go deep into this parable and understand it. First of all, um, so the particular kind of tree that's mentioned here is a fig tree. And apparently this fig tree is planted in the midst of a vineyard. So there are all kinds of vines growing grapes and olives or whatever else, you know. And, and there's this tree, a fig tree. And you should know that at least in that land in Israel, the fig tree is one of the most fruitful trees. You can expect to find fruit out of it 10 out of the 12 months of the year. So uh, the normal expectation is that of all the various different kind of you know, fruit that you might grow, the fig tree is the most fruitful. 10 out of 12 months, you will find uh, fruit on that tree. Now, uh, second thing just to kind of take note of here, apparently this fig tree... The problem with it was not only that it wasn't bearing fruit, but uh, it's planted in the midst of a vineyard, and one of the concerns of this owner is that it is taking up nutrients from the soil that might otherwise be used by fruitful plants, right? So, so one of the things when he says, cut it down, he says, why should it use up the soil? So there's this tree, it's not bearing any fruit, and his concern is not just that this tree doesn't have any fruit, but that it's actually like taking resources that could be used for the rest of his plants. I also want to just comment on, on, on this verse. In the middle of verse 7, this man says, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Um... Something about farming in Israel at that time, uh, they were totally dedicated to following God's word. And I wanted to show you these verses from the book of Leviticus because it'll give us some context into what's going on here. Uh, Leviticus chapter 19, there are some instructions. 
And the instructions say this, when you enter the land and plant any kind of fruit tree, regard its fruit as forbidden, it must not be eaten. For three years, you're to consider it forbidden. It must not be eaten. If you were to turn to Leviticus 19, you'd find out that the next verse says this, that on the fourth year, right? So three years, don't eat that fruit. On the fourth year, all the fruit that you have there, you're supposed to offer that to God. It's not for you. Don't go looking for fruit for yourself. It's for God. Offer it to God. So it's on the fifth year that you can finally now go out and look for fruit for yourself. Now, just so you know this, here's how the Israelites interpreted this verse. They interpreted the verse this way, that the first three years of a tree's life are just the first three years of the life. You do not start counting years until after the first three years. And so the first three years, the tree's just growing up. Year four is when the first of these three years in Leviticus 19 starts. So year one, don't touch that fruit. It's not yours. It's forbidden. Year five, right, is year two. Don't touch that fruit. It's forbidden. It's not yours. Year six is the third year here, Leviticus 19.23. The sixth year, the seventh year. That was the year that you were to take the fruit and you are to bring it and offer it to God. And that's how they interpreted this verse. It really is on the seventh year of a tree's life that now you're supposed to take that fruit and go and offer it to God. So the first opportunity an owner would have to go look for fruit himself would be on year eight. He says, now, for three years I've been coming to look for fruit. So let's count that out. Year eight is the first year. He walks out there, what's wrong with this fig tree? Stupid tree. Second year, what's going on here? He's now in the, count it up, right? Eight, nine, tenth year. He says, for three years I've been coming out here. Cut this tree down. All right, so you get this, right? This tree has not had fruit on it for 10 years. Okay, let's use, our, let's use our thoughts, our mind, our rationale, our logic. Is there going to be fruit on it next year? No way, right? I mean, there is nothing that would cause this owner to suspect there will ever be fruit on this tree. That's why he says, cut it down. It's stealing resources from the plants that are producing fruit. Cut this tree down. By the way, I mean, it's probably obvious, right? He's not talking about trees. This fig tree is like a metaphor, a simile for humanity. And by the way, this whole parable is going to be a conversation between God's justice and his mercy. Okay? So this isn't about just trees, it's about humanity. I'm sure it occurred to you that this terrorist act in Boston is not the first time humanity did not bear fruit. Right? I mean, I'm sure you're aware of the fact that throughout the history of the world, there has been sin, 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 sin. Is anything going to be different next year? I mean, is it? No. I mean, we have no reason to expect it. So here's what justice says. Cut it down. Cut it down. Now, as we're talking about humanity... You know, you think about this bombing in Boston. It's our first thought, right? Like, those guys should suffer. Like, God, do something. Stop them. Stop it. Why don't, God, why are you? Like, why don't you do something? Okay, now, in our mind, in our mind, um, it's so easy to see in an act like that how that act hurts other people. And that's why when we see how terrible that evil act, and it is evil. How terrible that hurt and pain is. It's easy for us to say, God, do something. Stop that. Here's what we don't do. We don't take stock. We don't take stock of how even our small sins harm others. So um, let's just take an example of a small sin. You know, we'll take one at random. How about gossip? That's probably a good one. We've all done that one this last week, right? At some point, someone came up and said, hey, do you hear about? And you're like, no, really? Okay, so, but we don't think much about it. Like, it's just, whatever, that's, okay, but but let's just say as an example, like uh, Devin and I, you know, we're involved in gossip about Jesus over there, okay? I'm like, hey, Devin, do you hear about Zeus? I mean, just, right? And, uh, you know, we feel good, right? We're on the inside, 
we're so much better than him. And, you know, all the good feelings we get from sin in the moment, that's why we do it, right? We're feeling so good right now. But here's what happens, right? Now, at some point, Devin is going to go over to Zeus and like, hey, Zeus, you know what Scott said about you yesterday? (laughs) And now what? Now my sin, which at the time, I just, we were having a good time, has hurt somebody else. We don't, okay, God, you've got to stop this pain. Stop it, God. Why? Where are you? Like, why don't you do something? That's what we cry out, right? And justice, you know what justice says? Cut it down. It's not going to be any different. There's no fruit coming from this tree. Cut it down. That's what justice cries out to God. There's also this cry of, of mercy. Wait. No, no, just wait. Just wait. Like, you know, this gardener says, just let me, you know, I'll dig out around the roots. I'll, I'll put fertilizer there. Just when they may be something. And, and there is this tension between what justice cries out and what mercy is crying out at the same time. Okay, let's take a moment and um, gather some thoughts. Thought number one from this passage. Tragedies provide a spiritual opportunity to lament the sinful human condition. When tragedies strike, like struck this last week in Boston or in Texas, there is this spiritual opportunity that we have to grieve over and lament the sinful human condition. Right? We're praying this prayer. God, may your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. We're acknowledging that that is not the case. Human beings are sinful, and as a result, there's all kinds of pain, grief, trouble in this world. And we, just, we not only lament that specific thing that happened and grieve over it, But I think what Jesus is doing as he moves from the particular to the universal is he's pushing us to not just grieve about this particular thing, but grieve over the whole condition of humanity. So that when we pray, may your will be done here on earth as in heaven, we kind of add a tag to that at the end in our mind. And by the way, God, let that start right here. Like it's not enough that God does something out there. We want him to do that. But but may it start right here. Here. Okay, second thought is we kind of just gather up some thoughts. We ought to recognize the time. So when we're asking ourselves the question, like, God, why haven't you done anything about this? Like, don't you see this tree? It's not bearing any fruit. I mean, it should just be cut down. Why hasn't God cut down the tree yet? Because there's this call for mercy, an equal call. So why is it that God, looking at humanity, hasn't just gone, forget about it? Because we're in between this time right now where God also is holding out his hands for mercy and and just waiting like maybe it's going to be different. Okay, third thought with regard to that. We depend upon God to change hearts. So I want you to think about this tree. We all agree, right? Next year, if everything's the same, nothing's going to change. Nothing is going to change. It's God... Who, it, it, it's his call for mercy that says, okay, hold on, I, I'm going to dig around the roots. I'm going to fertilize this tree. We depend upon God to do something. Which, by the way, is what the gospel is all about, right? We admit we are sinful people. We can't do anything about our own condition. We are actually dependent on God. If, if we're going to take this heart of stone and have it replaced with a heart of flesh, it's God who's got to do that work. If, if we're going to turn away from our hatred and begin to love, it's God who's got to change our heart. And, and, and that is what the gospel is all about. God took the initiative by sending his son Jesus who died to pay for our sins so that we could be brought back to God so that there might be a possibility that now that we're reconnected to him, we can begin to bear fruit. Okay, So we, as we look at these tragedies, as we begin to lament them, as we recognize the time, like, okay, why hasn't God stopped this yet? It's because there's a time for mercy. We're actually crying out to God, like, God, you're the only one who can do something here. Change our hearts. Okay, fourth thought as we gather up thoughts. These are actually words of John the Baptist. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Why does God wait? Why doesn't he just cut down the tree? Why doesn't he toss it all aside? 
because he wants to see fruit. His mercy is calling out and saying, hold on, maybe there'll be fruit. Just wait and see. So when God comes, what's he want to see from us? Okay, and what is the fruit? What is the fruit that we might bear? Those of us whose hearts have been changed by God, who have received the gospel, who have begun to follow Jesus, what is the fruit that we might bear? Well, the Apostle Paul says this, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So here's the thing. When we see a tragedy like what we've seen, you know, our natural reaction might just be to, to curse that tragedy, curse the people who have been involved with it. God, do something. American justice, you know, take care of them. And that might be a legitimate cry of our heart. But it's not enough. You know what we're supposed to do? Where there is hatred, we're supposed to sh sow love. Where there is discord, we're supposed to sow peace. Where there's a society where everything needs to be now, 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 right now for me, we're supposed to sow patience. When society and this world is full of rudeness, hatred, bigotry, we're supposed to be kind and gentle. Does that make sense? And so when we see tragedies like we've seen this last week, we don't just curse the darkness with more darkness. We see that there's a God who's at work in this world. He, his call of mercy is going out so that there's an opportunity that he might begin to change hearts. And where there are hearts that are changed, we who are his people are called to serve him by showing love, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And I think when we see tragedies like what we've seen, there's actually a call to God's people, the church. Church, rise up. There's a world of darkness out there that needs our light. There's a world of hatred that needs our love. There's a world of strife that needs our peace. There's a world that needs God. It needs Jesus Church, rise up. I mean, it's to each one of us to, to take this moment and say, okay, you know, God, you know, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and, and let that start right here with me. And if the church of Jesus Christ would do that, it would not just be that our worship would be here one hour on Sunday morning, but we'd walk out these doors worshiping God by shining his light in a dark world that needs it.